This audio is about proving God. I've said it a number of times, but I haven't explained why. That the only way you can really prove that God exists and what kind of God he is is to ask the ceiling for the proof. If God exists, he's obviously invisible. He's obviously omniscient, omnipotent, etc. Otherwise, he'd just be another creature that somebody else made. The ultimate containing set cannot be contained and will contain everything. And one of the attributes that the ultimate containing set must contain is personhood. You're a person. I'm a person. Where did that attribute come from? Okay, it is not biological. Personhood is not biological. Because your thoughts cannot be read biologically. Everything else can be read biologically, but not your thoughts. So then there must be something immaterial to your nature. And that immateriality I'm calling personhood. So how did your personhood get here since it's not biological? So there has to be a God because you exist. Okay, and this isn't quite like the, the typo and the stupidity of Descartes where he says, you know, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I exist. This is a little higher than that. Nobody can measure thought. There is not one single instrument on the planet that can measure thought. So where does it come from? Okay, it comes from somewhere. Now, you might want to say, well, I don't have proof that I even have a soul, which is, you know, the basic description that people apply to this personhood thing. Okay, then you need proof of that too. But part of the proof is already inside your head already. You're thinking. You couldn't hear me and understand what I was saying if you weren't thinking. So the question is, is that thinking uh, evidence of an immaterial nature that you yourself actually are? Or is it strictly biological and we just don't have the right instruments yet? So that has to be tested, doesn't it? Here you have what is claimed as evidence. You can actually, you know, know it. The fact that you know, the fact that you think, the fact that you will, the fact that you can process thought and that you can hear thought in others expressed through you know physical means that's a question of who are you okay so that can be tested obviously and what I'm trying to say here is that the question of God's existence can be tested in exactly the same way you know that you live and you think because you're doing it. You know that I live and I think because I'm doing it and you're listening to it. You're listening to it through a biological output, so to speak. But your ability to understand my, my thinking and my words is solely because you and I are the same kind of person. Okay, an animal is not a person. An animal can't do what you and I are doing right now. Okay, so if God exists, God has to be a person. And if God exists and God's a person, then there is a way that God can communicate to you just like I'm communicating to you right now, except if he's God, he doesn't have a mouth. He doesn't use sound. But he would have thought. That's the very essence of personhood thinking and he would know and if he's God and he knows and he thinks then all of his thoughts and all of his knowing and everything else about him is way higher than you and me okay so while you and I of ourselves cannot know what God knows and therefore cannot know God exists ourselves 
that doesn't prohibit a God person from making himself known to you, to me, to anyone else. The big question that atheists have is, well, where's the evidence that this God person exists? They're expecting the evidence to be delivered in a certain way. But look at the kind of nature of, of the claim. The nature of the claim is that this God is an invisible person, so, y you know, how are you going to get proof? You, on the other hand, maybe are also an invisible person housed inside a biological mechanism where, you know, you can actually give physical manifestation to your immaterial nature. Okay, but if God is immaterial and you're immaterial, then an immaterial God can communicate to the immaterial part of you. And therefore, and thereby, you would have evidence not only of God, but of your own immaterial nature. So it's killing two birds with one stone. Now, this God, and you're going to have to just go with me on this for, for the sake of argument. This God, if he exists and he made you, would want to communicate with you. And would want to communicate with you through thought, through the immaterial nature of your being, presuming you have one. And could make himself conclusively known to you. And would want to do that. I mean, if God exists, what is he getting out of your existence? Not a thing. So if he made you, he didn't make you in order for you to do pet tricks for him. Right? That's a logical conclusion. If God exists, I don't exist, you know, by his hand simply to do pet tricks for him. Because if God exists, he doesn't need anything from me. So that shoots religion down right away. So right away, you can sort of take a big sigh of relief as an atheist and say, oh, well, I can just divorce the whole religion thing. Yeah, you can. Because if God exists, does he need religion? Hell no. He doesn't need any religion of any kind that's ever been on the planet. That would have to be man's invention. Which indeed is what all atheists contend, and they're absolutely right about that. So now we get down to the root question. If God exists, and it's logical to presume God exists because you're a person and nobody can read thought, so it's a plausible at least contention that God exists based on the fact that you do. And nobody can measure your thought. There's no biological component that enables reading thought. So then thought is not biological. It might have a biological house, like the brain, but it itself is not biological. Nobody can find it. Okay, so if you have thought that's immaterial in you, that's evidence, or at least plausible argument for evidence, that there's an invisible God who's also immaterial, who also thinks, and therefore can, and wants to communicate to you. So how do you test for that? Real simple. Ask the ceiling. Hi God, if you really exist, I need proof. Now why should that be the method of testing? Primarily because if God exists and he wants you and he wants to communicate with you, then the real purpose for your existence is to have a relationship with this God. If you and I have a relationship, what are we doing? We'd be spending time together. We'd be talking to each other. So that's the heart of the idea. It isn't, this question about asking the ceiling isn't so much to prove God exists, but to say, yeah, okay, relationship. I mean, presumably, once you get this proof that God exists, because you find out, and I'm going to explain how you know, then what are you going to want to do? 
You're going to want to ask this guy a whole bunch of questions. You're going to want a whole bunch of answers. And you're going to want to have a life, a relationship with this God. To hell with religion. It has nothing to do with religion. Wouldn't God be a person you want to know? If God exists, why wouldn't you want to know him? If God exists, he made you, he wants you. Wouldn't you be at least curious to know him? Okay, but when you get to know somebody, what happens? Conversation. So how do you have a conversation with the invisible God that you can prove is not a hallucination on your part? Okay? That's the big question atheists ask. They presume that all of his Christians saying God exists are hallucinating. And that's a valid question to raise. Okay, so now you go through the same process we go through and then you'll know. Here's the process. You ask the ceiling, hi God, if you really exist, I need proof. And here's how you get it. There are several, three basic ideas here. Three basic ways. And you need to use them all. First one is understand what kind of communication you're going to get. The kind of communication you're going to get is thought. See, I'm communicating thought to you via, you know, uh, oral means. Sound. But there's actually thought inside the sound. And you're hearing it and you're understanding it to a certain extent. God doesn't need sound. So he's not going to use the sound, you know, as it were, package. But he saw it. So he's going to send you thought. Now the question and the hardship about that method is, is the thought that you're getting his or yours? If it's yours, obviously you're, you're, it's yours. It's just hallucination or a thought about God. But if it's his, how do you tell? Well, how do you tell in a normal conversation with a human being? The thoughts that are being expressed are not yours. In other words, if God is God and you are you, the way he thinks is not the way you think. It might be compatible in certain respects, but generally speaking, he's going to be very different from you. So the thoughts that occur to you, test them. Is that your own thinking? In other words, does it agree with your own thinking? Chances are it might a little bit, but it's going to differ a lot. It's going to be ideas and connections that you hadn't thought of, that wouldn't have occurred to you. All right? That's your first, you know, like clue. When you're talking to somebody else, there's always some kind of commonality between the two people. But there's all, also a huge difference in the way the two people connect the dots the kind of conclusions they come to, the way they express themselves, the ideas that they have. Well, the same thing's true between God and you, even much more so. So, hi, God, I'm looking at the ceiling now. I need proof of you. And then if God is going to talk immediately back to you or at any time, he's going to send you a thought, more likely many thoughts. That's the first thing. And then you can tell that the thoughts are not your own. Because the thoughts are not based, you know, the pattern of the thoughts, the content of the thoughts, the connection of the dots and the thoughts are not like the way you think. You're not smart enough to imagine being God. Uh, guaranteed. So then you start getting those thoughts and it's like, oh, wait a minute. That's, that's not me. And the longer you engage in this sort of requesting information from God and requesting him, you know, prove himself to you, the more you'll be able to tell the difference between the thoughts you get versus your own. It's very, very interesting. It's, this is the, the name, the main number one reason why you would ever want to believe in God. This is the heart of it. This is the best part of it is to hear him think. That's the whole reason I want to be a Christian. I could care less about heaven or hell. 
Heaven means I hear him. Hell means I don't. That's what it means to me. And guaranteed, once you get into this, that's what it's going to mean to you too. He's very different from me. Okay? End of story there. And you'll know this for yourself as you engage in this practice. Hi, God, I need to hear you. Hi, God, I need proof of you. However you want to phrase it to the ceiling. You'll feel like an idiot for a while. And he'll start answering you with thought. Second clue. This is the second way to prove that God exists. Start, I know you're going to hate this, but do it anyway. Start reading the Bible. Pick passages you don't like. Or pick passages you do like. Pick parts of the Bible you think are contradictions. Pick parts that you think are bad or wrong or immoral. I mean, every atheist has got in his mind some kind of argument against the Bible. Find your arguments in the Bible. And start arguing with God about it. Or talking to him about those passages. I'm dead serious about this. Because the way God's thoughts work, the Bible itself is the structure of God's thinking. That's why the Christian is commanded to, to use it, to learn it, to live on it. That's God's thinking in that book. It's expressed in writing so that we can learn it faster. In the Old Testament times, they, they, couldn't, they didn't have this. They had to get dreams and visions and all kind of fakakta nonsense. Because nobody was spiritually developed enough in the Old Testament until Moses to actually write it down. But you have God's whole thought structure written down. Now pick your favorite translation. Better still, if you can read Hebrew and Greek, or you're interested in learning, start learning it in Hebrew and Greek. But at least for the purposes of merely proving God's existence, pick your favorite translation. Open it up to wherever you want. Start yelling at God. Be honest. No harm in that. Talking to God. Arguing with God. About the passage you're reading. Wait and see what happens. He will answer you with thought. He, he answers with thought. And he answers using the Bible. He will make you think of. Or cause you to find passages that answer your objections or your questions. He does that to me every single day, all the time. Now, he's not going to do it quite so often in the beginning with you. It's, it's, a, it's a habit. And it's very shocking when it happens. So he's going to, you know, ease into it with you. But he will do it. Because this is how he does it with everybody. In other words, this is his preferred mechanism of showing himself to you. Thought and thought through Bible. It cuts through all the questions. It saves you a hell of a lot of time in analysis and proof. And you're getting a sort of objective thing going on here too. In other words, I know I'm not hallucinating because I don't know the Bible that well that all of a sudden the thought occurs to me to go look up some passage. And there it is, it's answering my question. You see what I'm trying to say? Then now you're getting supernatural proof. It's not magic. It's supernatural. God's abilities are higher than yours. They're natural to him. So it is supernatural to you. But it's not magic. It's a conversation. But he uses the Bible. So he sends thought. That was point one. Point two, he sends thought through the Bible. Learning the Bible is the mechanism whereby you learn God's thinking. And that's the whole purpose of being a Christian. There is no other purpose. You're not around here to do pet tricks or good deeds. You're just supposed to learn God. And I can't even think of another reason to want to be a Christian. I, don't, I can't think of another reason to want to believe in God. I want to believe in God because I want a relationship with Him. I could care less about heaven or hell or being a good person or morality or anything else. And it's not that I hate morality, but it's too small. People's mor moralities are puny and hypocritical. And if the purpose of knowing God was to be moral, well, I don't need God for that. I need God in order to be happy. Because I look at this world and I think it's too small. It's boring. 
people are hypocritical and puny and, you know, fragile. I want something better than that out of my life. Well, God, knowing God, that's better. And there's not a damn thing he wants from me. He's not here to punish me or abuse me. That's not going to do him any good. There's no fun in doing that. Okay, so he must want a conversation. Okay, let's have one. Conversation point one. Hi, God, you're, I'm looking at the ceiling. I feel like an idiot. I need proof of your existence. Point number two. Open your Bible wherever you want. Look at whatever passage you want. Talk to the ceiling again. Hi, God, this Exodus 21 passage doesn't make any sense to me. It seems like you like slavery. That's what I did when I made those videos on slavery 1, 2, and 3. How do I explain this, Dad? And then all of a sudden I knew how to explain it. Why? Because God showed me. Immediately. Now in your case, this initial exercise of talking to the ceiling and opening the Bible, it's not going to be immediate, it's going to be frustrating. And it's going to be short because you're going to, you're going to get nervous. Just do it again, do it again, do it again, 10 minutes at a time, 15 minutes at a time, until you freak out, and then stop. It's like exercise. You do a little bit at a time, and then a little more, then a little more, then a little longer. And you will get your proof. Now, there's a third way, and it's tied to the first two. The third way is that God's going to connect the dots in your life. As this conversation starts to progress and you get used to this feeling of being stupid when you ask the ceiling questions, feeling stupid when you open the Bible and asking questions or arguing, he's going to do a third thing. He's going to connect the dots in your life, past, present, and future, to show you that he's involved in your life, to show you that he knows about your life, stuff only you know. Events are going to happen in your life, coupled with stuff from your past, coupled with stuff only you know, and you're going to start to realize that he's actually sort of orchestrating stuff in your life. Now that's going to take a while. That's not going to be overnight. None of this is really overnight. But if you start talking to the ceiling now, you'll start getting answers within 24 hours. If you want them, and if you change your mind and you don't want them, then you're going to get silence. He doesn't, want, he doesn't want to violate your free will. So if you want the answer, you get it. If you don't want it, you don't get it until you do want it. Because it's rude to violate your free will. So he won't do that. Now, if you get into this mode, these three modes... Asking the ceiling and getting thought, opening a Bible somewhere and yelling at God about it or talking to him about it and thinking yourself hallucinating the whole time. And then three, him connecting the dots in your life. Try doing that for like 30 days, every day at least 10, 15, 20 minutes. You'll start to see the proof you've been looking for. And once you do, um, I need to kind of warn you a little bit. It becomes really addictive. So don't forget to do the normal things of life like brush your teeth, eat food on time, go to work on time. This gets very, very addictive because it's so enjoyable to actually have proof. It's so enjoyable to actually hear God think. It makes you not want to do anything else in life. And if you really want to know, that's why Christians are so, I guess we're so pushy. We're so enthusiastic because we actually know this person and we have a better reason to live now than just eating and sleeping and having sex and working and defecating. Life has a new meaning now. It's about knowing him. And once you start to know him, you don't want anything else. That's the danger. 
So hopefully I've warned you enough. I'm sorry this video, this audio will have ran for 20 minutes. But hopefully you've got some idea now, so now it's up to you. Are you going to ask the ceiling? If yes, do it. Are you going to start reading that Bible and yelling at the ceiling about it or whatever it is you want to do with it? Then start doing it. Do you want God to connect the dots in your life so you can see proof of Him? Then do it. Because you're immaterial and he's immaterial and the proof therefore is delivered by immaterial means. But you have a material Bible that you don't know how come it connects the way it does, but he does know and he can show you. There's, there's proof in a material expression. And then you have a material life that he's going to connect the dots about. And you can see all that objectively. And when he connects the dots for you, then you have an objective, as it were, arm of proof. Two arms of proof. Bible and the way the dots connect in your life. So now you have visible proof. And your friends, your family, cannot appreciate that proof. Because it's meant to be delivered inside the soul first the way I just described in this audio. So, go to it. If you want proof, now you know how to get it. Peace out.